One thing I would like to stress here at the outset of our epistemology course is that epistemology is a normative discipline. So what I mean by that is that epistemology is not about how things actually happen. It's not about, let's say, how people actually come to believe things and what they actually believe. Epistemology is about how people ought to come to believe things and about what they ought to believe. Just as logic is not about how people actually reason, but about how they ought to reason. And just as ethics is not about how people actually treat each other, but about how people ought to treat each other. So epistemology is about how people ought to come to believe things and then what they ought to believe. So when we ask questions in epistemology, questions like, well, can we have knowledge? Like we can't answer those questions by just asking a lot of people, hey, do you have some knowledge? And they say, yeah, 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 of course I have some knowledge. And we say, okay, you know, they have some knowledge. No, I mean, are they right? You know, can we, can we sort of believe them? I mean, they believe that they have knowledge, right? But, but is that the case? Did they really do what they ought to do? Um, did they do all the things that they ought to do? in order to get to that exalted, presumably, state of knowledge. So, given that epistemology is a normative discipline, it must be very, very much uh, focused on value, right? On something that is valuable. If we talk about logic, if we talk about how you ought to reason, well, there seems to be something that we value, right? We think it's right to draw certain conclusions from certain premises. We think it's wrong to draw other conclusions from those premises, right? Conclusions that don't follow. We think it's wrong. We think there's something wrong with the situation where people believe contradictions and so on and so forth. And the same is true in ethics, right? If people act according to what we would think are ethical standards, we think they're doing something right and if they don't, we think they're doing something wrong. There's something going wrong there. It's something that we don't want, right? And so when there's a normative discipline, there is a certain type of value involved. And so the question that we should ask about epistemology is, well, what is the valuable thing here, right? What is it that we value? And I think it's relatively obvious um, that at least one answer to that is going to be truth, right? It seems that what we value is truth. We want people to have the truth, to arrive at the truth. That is, we want people to believe the truth and we don't want them to believe what is false. So truth seems to be a value or maybe it's better to say that true belief seems to be a value, right? That seems to be something that we think is important, something that we think people should strive for, and so something that we can normatively investigate in such a way that we can say that people are doing the right thing when they are doing the thing that brings them to true belief, and that people are doing the wrong thing when they do the thing that brings them to false belief. And maybe all of that needs to be qualified and made a lot more complicated but as a basic picture, that seems to be about right. Okay, we value truth, we value true belief. Now, what I want to do in this video and the next video is ask some difficult questions about that value. And in this video, we will focus on this notion of true belief. And we're going to ask the question, well, why do we care if we believe true things or not? Right? Why do we care about believing true things? What's the value of that? What kind of value is that? And then in the next video, we will take the step from true belief to knowledge. And I will explain why those two things are not the same, why knowledge is not the same as true belief. And I will ask the question, okay, but what is so valuable about knowledge that makes it rise above even the level of true belief? Okay, so that's the plan. So, in this lecture, in this video, we are going to wonder, well, what is the value of true belief? And what kind of value does true belief have? And I'd like to start by pointing out that, um, well, by introducing two distinctions that we can use when we think about value. And those two distinctions are going to help us think through the value of true belief. 
And the first distinction I want to make is the distinction between, on the one hand, instrumental value and, on the other hand, intrinsic value. And so instrumental value is value that something has because it is a good instrument, right? Because it allows you to get what you want. So if somebody comes to you with a hammer, that's a very typical instrument, right? Somebody comes to you with a hammer and says, hey, what's the value of this thing? You might say, well, you know, what makes a hammer valuable? I mean, it's not so much the hammer as such, right? But what makes it valuable is that it's a very good tool for getting me certain things that I want, right? Maybe I want to make a chair and a hammer is the kind of thing I can use to make a chair. Or maybe I just want to hang a clock on the wall and a hammer is just the thing I need to get that clock on that wall or rather to get the nail in the wall that I can then hang the clock on and so on and so forth. And of course, this hammer is more valuable. Um, well, the more I need it and the better it is at its task, right? As an instrument. If I need to hang a lot of clocks on walls and if this is a really good hammer for getting nails into walls, that's going to be a really valuable tool for me. So that's instrumental value. There's also something that we call intrinsic value, right? And the idea would be that instrumental value can't be the only value because if, you know, this thing is valuable because it allows me to get that. Okay, but why would I want to get that? Well, maybe that, like hanging the clock on the wall is valuable because it allows me to know the time. Okay, and maybe knowing the time is valuable because it allows me to get to the train on time. And maybe getting to the train on time is valuable because it allows me to get to my work on time. And maybe getting to, I mean, okay, so if that's how value works, it's a sort of never ending sequence and it's hard to see why any of those things has any value at all, right? Because if I end up with something like, well, it's valuable that I get to my work on time because that will allow me to earn a lot of money for a big company. And I think, well, that's not really valuable, earning a lot of money for a big company that already has a lot of money. That it might turn out that, that all those things before that weren't valuable either, right? And I end up throwing my hammer away and joining some anarcho-syndicalist community. Um, assuming that they, they don't need any hammers. So there's got to be something somewhere that doesn't have just instrumental value, but that actually has intrinsic value. It's valuable in itself, right? Well, what's valuable in itself? Well, maybe friendship, for instance, is valuable in itself, or love is valuable in itself, or certain experiences, maybe happy experiences or deep experiences, or who knows, maybe those are intrinsically valuable, right? And all the other things are maybe valuable because they bring us to that, right? They help us get there. So that would be the distinction between instrumental value and uh, intrinsic value. And maybe it's important to point out that one thing can have both instrumental value and uh, intrinsic value at the same time. So for instance, just turning off my phone sounds if you were annoyed by them. Um, for instance, friendship, right? Friendship might have some instrumental value, right? Suppose that I lose my wallet and I think, oh no, I don't have enough money to get back home, but I've got some friends here. You know, of course they're gonna give me some money to come back home. That's instrumentally useful. But that's not sort of the real, like the core value of friendship, right? Having friends is just good. Okay. So that's instrumental versus intrinsic value. Another distinction that I would like to make here is subjective versus objective value. And so we might think about subjective value, like something might be subjectively valuable if I happen to like it, for instance, right? And you maybe don't. And if that's fine, if that's a sort of an okay situation, if that's a good way to think about a particular kind of value, like, oh, well, you know, I just really like, um, I just really like sappy romances and you don't. And so that means that the existence of sappy romances is valuable for me and it's not valuable for you. That seems more or less fine. An objective value would be a kind of value where we say, no, no, look, it's not about whether you like it. I mean, you sort of ought to strive for it, right? You, you ought to like it maybe, or at least you ought to try to attain it. 
And so usually when we think about something like ethical values, right? It's not like, well, you know, I don't really like murdering people. So murdering people is bad for me, but you like murdering people. So it's good for you. I mean, that would be treating ethical value as subjective value. And it's not usually how we think about ethics. Some people think about ethics like that, but most people don't think about ethics like that. Um, I think even fewer people think about logic like that, right? It would be really weird if you say, well, you know, I just like to have logically valid arguments. And so I should draw this conclusion from the data. But of course you like logically invalid arguments. So you should draw this completely opposite conclusion from the data. I mean, that, that's really not how we think about, about like reasoning. Um, and I think it's really not how we think about like epistemic value either, right? I mean, it's not, it doesn't seem to be a sort of optional aspect of our being human that we, you know, like to have some true beliefs. Oh, I like to have true beliefs. You like to have some false beliefs. Why not, you know, to each his own. That doesn't seem to be how we think about truth, belief, or value. And one indication of that is that like having a, there's something, there's something really weird. There's something paradoxical about somebody claiming to like false beliefs uh, or claiming to have false beliefs. I mean, suppose I come to you and I say, you know, I believe that it's going to rain tomorrow and that belief is completely false. Like I believe that it's going to rain tomorrow and that belief is completely false. But that doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense because if I, if I say, if I know that the belief is false, then I can't be believing it, right? I mean, it's part and parcel of believing something is believing that it's true. I mean, truth is sort of the intrinsic goal of belief. It's the intrinsic good of belief. You can't just take it out. <coughs> um, I think that's, that's a pretty fundamental fact about belief, a fundamental fact about truth, about how we connect those things together. Um, and it definitely indicates for me that we conceive of true belief I mean, as somehow the intrinsic goal of, of belief, uh, truth as the intrinsic goal of belief. And so, um, and so there's no room for different like tastes here, right? There's no room for, you know, having a taste for false beliefs. That just doesn't make sense, right? If you have a taste for false, but if you want to believe falsehoods, then you end up being unable to believe right? You end up being unable to be an epistemic agent, somebody who thinks and believes at all. Okay. I'm not going to go further into that, at least not here and now, but I wanted to bring up this idea of subjective and objective value and suggest that the kind of value that we talk about in epistemology is probably best thought of as an objective value, as something that we think is intrinsic um, to, you know, being somebody who thinks and tries to form beliefs. Yeah, I mean, if you do that, you are already committed to truth, to the value of truth. Okay, to truth as something that you want to strive for in your beliefs. So, having said that, like having taken a, a bit of a side here on the subjective versus objective side, have I also already taken a side on the instrumental versus intrinsic debate, right? Because I didn't really ask the question and I haven't answered the question. Well, is true belief, if it's valuable, is it instrumentally valuable or is it intrinsically valuable or maybe both? Now, there's a very good case, at least at first sight, a very good case to be made. And it's a pretty popular case uh, to be made that true belief is instrumentally valid. And so maybe if true belief is instrumentally valid, maybe that is the value of belief. And that's why we care about it. Okay, so why would people say that true beliefs are instrumentally valid? Well, let's start with an example, right? Suppose that I really want some orange juice. How am I going to get some orange juice? Well, I, you know, check my beliefs about where the nearest orange juice is. 
well, or the nearest orange juice that I can legally acquire. Is there any orange juice in my fridge? Is there any orange juice in my storage? Or in case of that neither, well, where's the you know closest shop where they have orange juice? Well, suppose that I believe that there's orange juice in my fridge. Right, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go downstairs, I'm gonna open the fridge, I'm gonna, well, what's gonna happen? Right, if I'm right, if my belief is true, I'm gonna take the orange juice and, you know, enjoy the awesome sensation of orange juice. And if my belief is false, I will be sorely disappointed, right? And I will have gone there for nothing and I should have taken a different course of action. And so that's one example, but of course we can see that quite in general, right, if you have true beliefs, you will be probably in a much better position to attain your goals than if you have false beliefs. If I have false beliefs about where the orange juice is, it's going to be a lot harder for me to get orange juice than if I have true beliefs about um, the location of orange juice. And this is true for a lot of things that I could have beliefs about, right? So true beliefs help me attain my other goals, and so they seem to be instrumentally valuable. And so maybe when in epistemology we say that, okay, the good of belief is truth or something like that, like we have to strive for truth. Um, and when we make normative claims about things by saying, well, you know, if you think in that way, you're going to attain truth, so that's good. And if you think that way, you're not gonna attain truth, so that's bad, right? Maybe we are making those claims based on the instrumental value of true belief. Well, maybe, but there are a lot of reasons to think that this account can't be quite right. I mean, there's something true about this account, but it is probably not capturing the entire story about the value of true belief. So here's a couple of problems. The first is that a lot of true beliefs don't seem to be instrumentally valuable at all. Right? I mean, I have a lot of true beliefs that are just not going to help me attain any of my goals in sort of like any conceivable, well, maybe conceivable, but any realistic circumstances. So for instance, I have, you know, some knowledge about ancient Greek philosophy, and I have some knowledge about the outer planets of the solar system. And I, I mean, when is it going to be useful for me, right? The answer to the question, where is the orange juice is never going to be on Neptune. Uh, it's also never going to be, oh, um, Socrates has it in his fridge, right? I mean, what is what is the point of knowing all that stuff? If I'm just thinking in terms of uh, in terms of my practical goals, then a lot of the knowledge that I have acquired during my life, and even a lot of the knowledge that I keep acquiring in my life, like which I go out of my way maybe to read books about and stuff like that, just doesn't seem very valuable, right? Instrumentally valuable, no, not really. So there's that. I mean, there seems to be quite a number of true beliefs that don't have any instrumental value. Sometimes it might actually be valuable to have false beliefs. Uh, for instance, in cases of self-confidence, if I believe that I'm really good at something, that might actually help me perform better. That might be a useful belief. Um, there's this like famous statistic, which I which I think is actually true, that uh, oh I I'm, now I'm going to make up a number, but it's something like 70 or 80 percent of all car drivers believe that they are better than average at driving, and of course I mean that's that's hardly possible, um, but maybe it's useful that people have this overblown idea about their own capabilities. Right? Maybe that's good because maybe it makes them more confident and better car drivers. Of course, there are also other cases. I mean, suppose that I think that my orange juice is in the fridge, even though it's not there, and I go to the fridge to get the orange juice. I open the fridge and I, oh, I see that I forgot to buy food for tonight. And I see it just in time to get to the shop and buy food before it closes. That's great. So it was extremely useful for me to have this false belief about where the orange juice is. Hmm. Um, so it's certainly not the case that false beliefs are always useless or, or even less useful than true beliefs. <coughs> there might even be a lot of cases where it's valuable to just be ignorant about something. Right? I mean, suppose that I suddenly gained knowledge 
of every horrific murder that ever happened before 500 AD. That would be a terrible burden and it would be completely useless to me, right? I mean, I would probably be overwhelmed with sorrow and despair knowing about all these terrible, tragic events that are 1500 years or more in the past and that I can't do anything about. Yeah, you know, it would be, it would be better to be ignorant. Ignorance sometimes may be bliss. So there's certainly not a sort of very clear one-on-one -on -one relation between having a true belief and it having some kind of instrumental value for you. In fact, if we think about instrumental value, then one of the things that we learn from cognitive psychology is that truth is not an overriding goal. So cognitive psychology has taught us a lot of things, but one of the things that it has, I think, most, most clearly taught us is that actual cognition in human beings uh, tries to strike balances, including, very importantly, a balance between speed and accuracy. So the human cognitive system, the human cognitive system is not always trying to find the truth as best as it can, because finding the truth as best as it can could be a very time consuming, laborious process. Uh, and often you also just want speed, right? You see something, your brain is trying to work out whether it's a tiger that you need to run away from. You know, accuracy is not the most important thing. Like speed is of the essence. It's better to run away for what turns out to be a little kitten once in a while than to be eaten by a tiger because you take too long thinking about it. So it's certainly not the case that trying to attain true belief is always instrumentally useful. Sometimes you just go with the first hunch and that's the best course of action, instrumentally speaking. Um, taking back a step, I suppose that it's also true that instrumental value just seems like the wrong kind of thing. Um, when we think of epistemology as sort of, you know, trying to think through how we should perform the search for truth. Like if we take this analogy with logic and with ethics, let's take ethics, if we take that seriously. If somebody told you, well, you know, not murdering, it's pretty good because it's very instrumentally valuable. Right? If you go around murdering people, they throw you in jail or they might murder you back. Well, that's right. right. I mean, going about murdering people is usually not a very like practical strategy for leading a happy life. But that's that's not why it's wrong. You know, I mean, that's one reason prudent, a prudential reason to not murder, but it's, it's not what makes it morally wrong. And so if somebody told you that, hey, a certain way of gaining beliefs that it's wrong because it doesn't give you the results you want, well, that might be a reason to not engage in it, but it doesn't seem to go deep enough. I mean, is it true, right? I mean, is it a way to get at true beliefs or not, right? So if somebody says, okay, you shouldn't just believe everything that, oh, let's say some influencer on YouTube, let's call him Mr. X, you shouldn't believe everything that Mr. X says, tells you, um, because that way you're sometimes not gonna achieve your goals. You know, that, that could be right but it seems that there's an even deeper and more important question, which is, you know, is Mr. X right? Is he telling the truth? Does he have good reasons for believing what he believes? Are you being a responsible person when you believe Mr. X, right? There seems to be something that goes beyond mere instrumentality. And so I think the option that definitely should be on the table is that true belief is somehow intrinsically valuable. Right, that trying to attain to the truth is one of the things that as human beings we just ought to do. Right? It's something that we sort of objectively ought to do, but it's also something that we ought to do as such. Right? Trying to achieve the truth is valuable because it is trying to achieve the truth. Right? That's just one of the things that is valuable for us human beings. Knowing more about the universe, that's just good knowing more about ourselves, that's just good. If you say, I don't believe that, 
Um, I don't think I have here a knockdown argument right against you. What we would have to do is delve more deeply into that strain of thought I was developing earlier, where I tried to say, well, if you don't strive for truth, then you can't really even believe things. And if you can't really believe things, then you can't even sort of really think. And so I would have to try to argue that if you disagree with me, that true beliefs are intrinsically valuable. Um, if you disagree with that, then somehow you are sort of giving up on your own status as a thinker. And maybe I could make that work, right? And if I could make that work, then maybe you can say, yeah, well, whatever, right? Give up on my status as a thinker. I have no idea how somebody who gives us gives up on their status as a thinker, what they what they behave like. I guess I don't know whether they can behave like anything. I mean, they they just things happen, right? Things happen to to the physical system that they are, or something like that. Um, not going to go into that right now, but my conclusion at this point of our investigation would be that you know it makes a lot of sense to think of true belief as something that is objectively and intrinsically valuable even though sometimes <coughs> having those true beliefs might not be um it might the value of that might not outweigh negative values that also attach to it right so if somebody came to me and said hey victor you claim that True beliefs are valuable. Well, here are all those true beliefs about every horrific murder that happened before 500 AD. Do you want it? Uh, you know, there's a sense maybe in which it would be valuable, but the psychologically crippling effect on me would be much more negative than any value that, that this knowledge has for me, right? And so I think I would still be allowed to say no thanks, right? I, I don't need that. Uh, I don't need that knowledge. So what I'm suggesting is true belief, it's intrinsically and objectively valuable, but maybe not always outweighing certain negatives that might attach to it, right? In cases of debilitating knowledge or, you know, knowledge that really upsets you psychologically or whatever. You don't need to agree with any of this, but I hope it helps you think through what your own position on the value of true belief is. In the next video, we will take a look at the value not of true belief, but of knowledge.